So today I'll talk about Bitcoin and the Lightning Network, uh, just as you say. So of course it's, it's quite a uh, huge topic for 30 minutes, of course. And so the, the challenge for me was to try to grasp what I think makes Bitcoin, makes Bitcoin so, so special and to, yeah, to try to put it in a nutshell. Um, so it won't be very technical, I think, or maybe it will, uh, we'll see. But uh, the idea is to, uh, like I said, yeah, show what is so special about Bitcoin and how it's, uh, it is native money for the internet. Um, so maybe I'm going to introduce myself a little bit uh, before, before I start. So I work at a company called NN Markets, which uh, aims at building some kind of new finance using Bitcoin and the Lightning Network. I write uh, on the blog at fanismechalakis.fr um, so there are various kinds of posts there so some are technical, some are uh, just random thoughts and so on and I should post sometimes on Twitter so you can follow me if you want and as you said I also have a, a YouTube channel um, but the last video was like one year ago but I I, I plan to go back there uh, in the near future, so yeah. Um, and so now maybe let's start by with some uh, Bitcoin prehistory. So the, the, the purpose of this slide is to highlight uh, something that maybe isn't um, necessarily um, obvious uh, in, in the at first sight, which is that Bitcoin isn't some kind of a revolution that occurred uh, all of a sudden, it's um, much more like a continuous process, which started um, in the 70s with uh, TCP IP, of course, and which uh, developed uh, decade after decade, notably through uh, the work of cryptographs and so new, um, new encryption protocols and so on. So on this uh, chronology, we can see, for example, uh, RSA, we can see uh, Diffie and Elman, we can see a lot of stuff. We can see uh, Adam Back's uh, Ashcash, which was the first iteration of proof of work that was used as uh, an anti-spam and anti-DOS countermeasure, and so on. And so we see that Bitcoin really was just the, the, the last brick on a big wall and and yeah and so Satoshi Nakamoto didn't, didn't come with uh, this invention uh, out of thin air and it was a continuous effort of many very talented people across a few decades. So that being said, um, I think the first question we want to ask ourselves is so what the hell is Bitcoin, right? And one answer to this could be uh, to take a look at the Bitcoin white paper and its title and the title of the white paper is Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. So maybe we have an answer, so... And, but now that we've said that, what does it mean? What is a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system? Um, oh, I just noticed that I haven't put my camera on, so I, maybe I would do this because it, maybe it's a bit uh, nicer for people, yeah, can see my face at the same time, right. And um, so what does it mean to have a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system? So before Bitcoin, and actually it's still the case today, but it's unfortunate in my opinion. So when you wanted to do a payment online, you always had to deal with an intermediary. For example, it's Visa, it's MasterCard, it's uh, PayPal, for example. And so when you go to pay on an online shop, you always have to go through an intermediary or several intermediaries. For example, if you take PayPal, often there is also your bank that is involved and so on. And it's because um, it is required. So it was required to have an intermediary in order to check, for example, that the user really adds money uh, to pay for the, the, the good or service. Um, it was also necessary to ensure that the user didn't use the same money twice, which is called double spending, um, and so on. So 
And before Bitcoin, we didn't knew any way to do it without um, a third party. And then Bitcoin came and show show a way to do it without a third party. And so thanks to Bitcoin, now it's possible to transact on the internet uh, in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. And just like we would do with cash when we meet someone on the street. So we hand the money and the bills and the other person, so that the merchant, for example, can receive the bills. And now we've paid him or her and it's done. And so it was really difficult to replicate uh, this thing that cash enables, um, but uh, on the internet. And so it wasn't possible until Bitcoin. And now with Bitcoin it's possible and that's exactly what Bitcoin does. Um, and so um, Bitcoin ends an answer to our question to what the fuck is Bitcoin could be Bitcoin is digital cash for a digital age. But why is it useful to have uh, digital cash and so it's useful for most uh, mostly the, the same reasons as for uh, cash the cash that we use in uh, in real life so for example for instance there is autonomy so when you don't have to deal with a third party uh, it means you're far more autonomous and for example your third party could have um, um, moments where when it's not online could have problems, issues, it could be down and so on. And so it's quite useful to be able to pay without having to know whether your third party is online or not. Um, there is transparency as well on how uh, the payment system works. Because when you use Visa or MasterCard, of course, you have no idea what's going on behind the scenes. But with Bitcoin, because it's open source software, you know exactly what happens, which is quite interesting i think um, and on the other end so there is transparency on how it works but there is also privacy which means that your private information regarding the payment are protected so it's maybe it may be not um, a protection that is as strong as with cash when you meet someone in the in the street but it's uh, some protection uh, which is uh, quite hard to achieve uh, when you're doing digital transactions, which is uh, in any way far better with Bitcoin than with uh, any regular uh, third party, for example. And then there is uh, a property of uh, a cash system that is, I think, maybe the, the most important one, which is censorship resistance. So what is censorship resistance? It's the ability to send or receive money and even to hold money uh, without anyone being able to uh, stop you from doing so. So, for example, we, we can see that today, even in, in democratic countries, there is more and more um, financial surveillance, there is more and more financial repression, um, there are more and more uh, restrictions as to how you're allowed to spend your money uh, when it's in the bank. And so, censorship resistance really goes against uh, all of this. And the aim is to allow you to spend your money whenever you want, the way you want to. And then there is efficient, efficiency sorry, and fast settlement. Um, and so I put it in the end because it's not uh, for me the main, uh, main achievement of Bitcoin. But Bitcoin is indeed far more efficient at settling transactions than most other payment network. Um, for example, when you use Visa, it may appear that so, or any other credit card payment system. It may appear as a transaction is uh, instant, but in fact, what happens behind the scenes is that the transaction, so the money leaves your account quite quickly and you have this nice receipt on the machine. But what happens behind the scenes is that the merchant receives the money only days, if not weeks later. And on Bitcoin, the settlement therefore is far more, uh, far quicker than this. Um, and so another interesting thing I think about Bitcoin is that there is this kind of paradox. Bitcoin is both apolitical and heavily opinionated. Um, why do we say that? Why do we like to say that Bitcoin is apolitical? It's simply because Bitcoin is for everyone. It's due to the permissionless nature of Bitcoin. 
which means that anyone can um, can uh, boot a node on any kind of computer from a laptop to uh, a dedicated, ma dedicated machine to uh, some Raspberry Pi and so on and join the Bitcoin network with this machine and transact freely on the Bitcoin network, which is uh, something quite new when compared to um, other financial network. And on the other hand, there is the opinionated part because um, like a like lot of software, Bitcoin is really uh, built, so was built and is still built today with some uh, strong uh, philosophical uh, aspects in mind. And so mainly the cypherpunk ethos and, and some, uh, something I call the monetary autonomy, which is also very important, I think. And so uh, cypherpunk ethos um, means basically the use of cryptography to ensure privacy in a digital age. And um, cryptography plays a great role in Bitcoin, of course, and it enables a few very interesting properties. For instance, there is strong digital ownership. It's achieved through public key cryptography, which means that um, when, you, when we say we, you own Bitcoin, what happens, what it means is that you know the private key associated with those Bitcoins. And so only you can spend them as long as you're the only one who knows this private key, um, which, uh, which is very interesting. And there is as well digital scarcity. Um, so it's, it can have two, two meanings. One meaning is uh, that Bitcoin uh, prevents double spending. So that's what I was referring to earlier when I gave an example. So when I highlighted the difference between uh, how we did uh, online transactions before and after. And so with Bitcoin, um, you can be sure that someone who pays you with Bitcoin hasn't spent them elsewhere, which is uh, absolutely crucial in order to be sure to be paid. And there is the other aspect of this digital scarcity, which is the unforced 21 million supply. And that's where there is some kind of um, opinion, some kind of uh, philosophical and economic um, theory that um, enters, that can be uh, felt into the way Bitcoin was built. So there is this idea that um, we create uh, a network, a monetary network that is autonomous, which means that it isn't pegged to any existing currency. Because before Bitcoin, there were some other projects who tried to create some uh, alternative payment network on the internet. But they were all dependent on the dollar. For example, there is the famous uh, Liberty Reserve, where you had uh, Liberty Dollars, which were pegged one-to-one -one with real dollars in a, in a vault. And the problem, so one of the reasons it failed, was that it was relying on an external currency, uh, an already existing currency, which was the dollar. And with Bitcoin, the, one of the um, one of the genius things that Satoshi Nakamoto found with Bitcoin was to use uh, a native currency, native to the network, which is Bitcoin. And um, now, when we decide to do that, there is a question that arises, which is, how do we deal with this currency? How do we manage it? Because we want to have a, to create a decentralized network. So, but at the same time, usually, when we create a new currency, there is an entity that is in charge of this currency. So, for instance, central banks. Um, but here with, with Bitcoin, we don't want to have that, else it wouldn't be decentralized. So that's why the, the way the money, the monetary supply, for, for instance, of Bitcoin should, um, should evolve was uh, programmatically determined in the beginning to be 21 million in the end. And to do so, the rewards, so the new Bitcoins that uh, Bitcoin miners are allowed to create uh, every block, uh, decreased, uh, so it's halved, so it's divided by two, every 210,000 blocks. And that's how uh, asymptotically we reach uh, 21 million Bitcoin in total and not one more. And uh, hence digital scarcity, which is quite interesting and comes from the idea that, so, we don't know who Satoshi Nakamoto was, but it seems like he was keen to the idea of having 
um, a fixed supply in money, like it was the case for gold before uh, before Bretton Woods and stuff. And last but not least, there is predictability, which is I think also a very important feature. So, like I just said, the monetary emission, for instance, is completely predictable because you know what uh, you know what reward miners will be allowed to claim. Uh, each time they uh, find a new block, so you know what, uh, and and you know also that there will be uh, uh, one block every ten minutes, uh, approximately. So you can know uh, in the distant, even in the distant future, future, sorry, um, what amount of Bitcoin there will be in circulation, which is completely impossible with uh, uh, other monetary networks such as uh, the, the US dollar or the euro that are centrally managed by central banks and where the new decisions can be made um, overnight and where everything changes uh, in a matter of days or months. Uh, in Bitcoin we have a great predictability um, in this regard and there is also protocol ossification which is the fact that the Bitcoin protocol evolves uh, very carefully. Uh, for example, when there is an update to um, the protocol, this update is always backward compatible, which means that uh, people who run Bitcoin nodes aren't forced to upgrade to stay in touch with the rest of the network. They can just stay on their version of the, of the protocol if they want to and still be able to communicate with other nodes in the network who have already transitioned to the new version of the, of the software. Um, and it also allows um, people who build other protocols or other applications on top of Bitcoin to build them uh, while knowing that uh, things will stay just like they are for quite a long time and so they can be uh, they can build um, the application knowing that which is not the case for many of the cryptocurrencies project where things tend to evolve quite rapidly um, so now that we've said that, there is another question that I've said, which is, um, is Bitcoin a new technology or is it a new form of money? Because we've seen, we, we, we begin to see that there are two aspects somehow in Bitcoin. So it's a protocol, it's software, so it's technology. But uh, at the same time, it's, it's used more and more as money. So what is it exactly? And so an answer could be Bitcoin is a new monetary technology. And in this monetary technology, there is a monetary protocol plus a payment protocol, which is uh, quite new actually. So we have in the same uh, protocol, the same object, uh, a monetary layer, which defines how we create new unit of money, how money, um, so the, the 21 million uh, max supply of Bitcoin, for example. And we have the payment protocol, which allows people to send Bitcoin, receive Bitcoin, move Bitcoins, and the two things are um, placed into the same protocol. And so this way, Bitcoin is able to replace a lot of things. It can replace central banks. So the Fed, the ECB, for example, so it does the same job as they do, but in a more programmatic manner. It can replace wholesale payment networks, so, such as SWIFT, so payment network uh, between banks, for example, or big institutions. But it isn't limited to that because anyone can use it as it is permissionless. So even retail, so people like you and me can use Bitcoin. And hence, it can even replace uh, retail payment networks such as Visa, Mastercard. So of course, uh, the next question is, but can it, right? Uh, is it really possible for Bitcoin to replace all those things? So the question actually is, how does Bitcoin scale as a payment network? Because um, even uh, Bitcoin deniers today um, agree on the fact that it could be used as money, yeah, okay, um, in the sense that um, there is this digital, digital gold narrative that is quite accepted today, that Bitcoin is some kind of digital gold, and but, okay, nobody spends it and so on. So it seems like the real question today, now that Bitcoin has succeeded, has succeed, some uh, kind of succeed as a store of value, is can it succeed as a payment network too? And the problem is that uh, it's quite hard to do both 
so both uh, a monetary layer, a store value layer, and a payment layer, and to do both very well at the same time. Why? Because if you want to keep a strong monetary layer, you want to have a lot of nodes on this monetary layer so that everyone can keep everyone in check and ensure that the rules are respected. For example, the 21 million Bitcoin rules. And to ensure that anyone can run a node, a Bitcoin node, you have to keep the requirement for such a machine quite low. So you have to keep uh, the storage required to have a Bitcoin node low. You have to uh, keep the compute power low. You have to keep the bandwidth low. And that's why um, the large majority of the Bitcoin community decided that um, the size of Bitcoin blocks should remain at uh, one megabyte per block. Um, so blocks are not infinite and we can therefore not fit uh, an infinite number of transactions in each block. So an approximation, so it depends on each transaction, each Bitcoin transaction doesn't uh, weight uh, the exact same amount of data, of data, sorry. Uh, but we can say, for example, that it's equivalent to 3000 transactions. So what that means is that as we have one block every 10 minutes, if there are more than 3,000 transactions every 10 minutes that are done on the network, um, all transactions will not be able to be uh, confirmed in the next block. And so there will be a queue, there will be some transactions that accumulate and wait for the next block to be conf to, for them to be confirmed. And so if there are a lot and uh, really a lot of transactions, uh, it can uh, requires some time from, for your transaction to be confirmed. So um, we saw, saw that really well in 2017 when there was a, a huge load of Bitcoin transactions and really the, the, the mempool, which is a space where uh, transactions that are waiting for confirmation are stored, was really big and were uh, often over capacity. And so this uh, one block every 10 minutes and these 3000 transactions per block uh, constraints lead us to uh, five transactions per second throughput, which is quite low when we compare it to um, wholesale networks such as Swift or to um, retail networks such as Visa, for example. And we can we, we feel that yeah, it's quite obvious that we cannot replace uh, every institution that I mentioned before, every payment network the network that is able to do only five transactions per second. So it was a trade-off and to keep strong guarantees regarding the monetary layer, to enforce really the rules of the Bitcoin layer and the Bitcoin money, we decided to uh, dwarf uh, the payment aspect. Uh, but uh, it isn't necessarily the end of Bitcoin as uh, of Bitcoin for payment as we can see right now, because lightning strikes. So the idea was that um, we had some, we had done a choice between the monetary aspect of Bitcoin and the payment aspect of Bitcoin. And the community seemed seem to have choose uh, to go for the monetary aspect. Um, and so the Bitcoin base layer was uh, to be regarded as uh, having one job above all, which is uh, ensure the monetary policy of Bitcoin. And of course, we can still do payment on Bitcoin. It works very well. You can do it for cheap right now because there isn't a lot of volume, but it isn't the thing we are trying to optimize on Bitcoin. And so in order to make uh, cheap Bitcoin payments feasible, we had to build a dedicated payment network on top of Bitcoin. And one of these payment networks is Lightning. Um, and the idea is that instead of doing every transaction we want to do in Bitcoin directly on the base layer, on the blockchain, um, we will uh, do some of them in, so elsewhere and only uh, record uh, some kind of footprint uh, on the blockchain. And so what we do is that uh, when we want to transact with someone else, we can on what we call a channel with them. So this opening of a channel occurs via uh, a Bitcoin transaction. And we and once the channel is 
uh, opened, we can uh, do um, any number of transactions we want with the person we open the channel with. Once we're done, so after maybe hundreds of transactions, we can close the channel and this uh, channel closing is another Bitcoin transaction. And so we just did two Bitcoin transactions, so transactions that were on the Bitcoin blockchain, but it allowed us to do uh, hundreds, if not thousands of transactions inside the channel. And another thing that is really interesting is that Lightning is a network. So it's a Lightning network, which means that you don't have to be directly connected with someone when we, you want to transact with them. You can um, use the channels of other nodes in the Lightning Network to reach your final recipient. Um, and so you can have, for example, only one channel and reach uh, a great part of the Lightning Network through this channel. Um, and this is why it's quite promising because else you'd have to open a new channel every time you want to transact with someone else, which isn't scaling at all. But with this networking feature, uh, where you can use uh, other people's channels, you can actually scale Bitcoin a little bit to um, to have um, um, yeah more throughput, more transactions per second with Bitcoin. Um, and so this is my final slide, I think. Um, so when we go back to the beginning of the, the presentation, we, we saw that the old world, the traditional financial system, worked with intermediaries. And so moreover, with oligopolistic uh, intermediary, you can't really challenge Visa or MasterCard today. Um, with Bitcoin, it's peer-to-peer. -peer. You just broadcast a transaction to the Bitcoin network and uh, your recipient is also on the Bitcoin network and will receive the Bitcoin once uh, the transaction has been mined by uh, a miner, uh, whoever this miner is. And with Lightning, it's kind of uh, a mix of the two because you can, if you want, open a direct channel with your, uh, the person you are trying to pay. And so, in a sense, it's quite equivalent to Bitcoin because you have to open a channel with them and so channel means a Bitcoin transaction first. Or you can, uh, if you don't uh, want to open a direct channel with them, you can uh, route your, your payment across the channels of other nodes of the network. And so each of these nodes is some kind of third party, some kind of payment processor. And so Lightning is um, um, can, so can be viewed as um, a payment processor network where there are uh, hundreds or maybe even thousands of uh, payment processors that compete uh, to be chosen by uh, customers, which is the user in our case. Um, and so it's like if you had Visa and MasterCard, for example, that were operating on the same network for example, Visa had 20 nodes on the network and MasterCard had 50 nodes, I don't know. But there are plenty of other nodes. Some, some um, entities only have one node, some have bigger resources and have multiple nodes, but everyone is on the same network, uh, which allows for um, competition, which allows uh, users to choose through which nodes they want to, um, to reach their destination and so on. So, we, we go from this um, situation where there is an oligopolistic uh, situation where with a few intermediaries to uh, a really open world where everybody can be a, a payment processor for someone else. And yeah, that's it. Uh, maybe I rushed it a little bit, but uh, yeah, I guess I'll admit. So thanks a lot. Um, feel free to, to ask any question you may have. Um, that's nice, thanks. Uh, maybe I can open with the first question because uh, um, maybe good to. I'm curious about uh, what's the current state about uh, Lightning Network development and what kind of challenge uh, you're facing. Okay, yeah, uh, good question. Uh, so, the current state of Lightning development. Uh, so, one thing interesting about Lightning is that it's built uh, in common between three, uh, three main implementations. So there is a specification, a standard, 
that defines um, how the different implementation, implementations should build their software. And there is um, each implementation, so then can, so they have to implement, of course, uh, the standard parts, but they can, uh, on other parts, they can make their own decisions. Um, and it, uh, it enables something quite interesting, I think, which is um, the possibility to have a completely uh, interoperable, um, so interoperability yeah, between a uh, different version of the same, same specification. And so you can choose, uh, depending on your needs, uh, either one implementation or the other. Um, and so, for example, today we have a big discussion around uh, some new kind of uh, of uh, payment identifiers on, on Lightning, and not all implementations see it as a priority, for example, which can create some uh, tensions between developers, but which is also quite interesting because if a user doesn't see it as a priority either, then he can choose to stick with the implementation that doesn't see it as a priority, and it will be fine because the other, this implementation will then uh, work more on something that maybe he finds more useful. And on the other hand, someone who finds this new uh, payment identifier thing really important will be able to uh, switch to another implementation that uh, prioritizes this in their development. Um, what were your second, second part of the question? I don't remember. Um, what kind of challenges are you facing? Maybe. Yeah, um, yeah. Maybe this is one of the huge challenge of Lightning today is, um, I think, payment reliability. Because um, so when you do a payment on Lightning, as I said, you often you you don't have a direct channel with the person you want to pay, and so you have to find a route that goes through other nodes on the network. And what we can see from this. A description so it's a small part of the network we can see that there are lots of channels so there are lots of uh, different possible routes to reach another node and um, these routes are not uh, deterministic so it's not like in google maps where uh, so the, the software knows that this road is open and you can go through it here there is a liquidity aspect because for a payment to go through a channel uh, there are liquidity requirements you have to have enough liquidity on the right side of the channel for it to be moved across the channel to the other end and you don't know you're not aware of the liquidity repartition so how the funds are uh, disposed in a channel that doesn't belong to you so you have to take guesses and hence, there is a, a probabilistic aspect in the payment routing on the Lightning Network, which makes everything uh, more complicated in uh, regarding uh, past finding and so on. And so there is, it's um, a real challenge today to be able to uh, quickly find a route that will work uh, the first time you try it. Often you, you have to find the first route and this route doesn't work and so you try another and it's because uh, most software uh, today tries to optimize for uh, routing fees, so for you to pay uh, as, uh, as low as less fees as possible, and which isn't, isn't uh, necessarily a good idea. And so there, is, there are discussions today to instead optimize for uh, reliability of payments, which maybe will lead to more interesting stuff, I think. And okay. yeah. Maybe a, a quick question about it. Uh, for example, for a shop, uh, so it means that uh, this shop needs to maintain and hold some Bitcoin on his uh, channel, right? For clients? Yeah, so there is this problem as well that, uh, so when you, typically when you're a merchant, you're in a station where um, payments will flow essentially in one way only, which is from customers to you. And so the liquidity on your channels um, will quite quickly go from the other side to your side. And when everything is on your side, the other side is depleted and you can't receive payments anymore. So you have, uh, you have 
several solutions to this problem. One would be to close this channel. So this allows you to get the money back, but directly on the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, and then you open a new channel with liquidity on the other side uh, to receive payments again. Or you can do some uh, rebalancing where you move the liquidity so that uh, it can be on the other side again. But yeah, it's a, so uh, uh, Lightning is a liquidity network and so the, most of the challenges on Lightning today are concerned with uh, liquidity management. Okay. Uh, maybe I can pick up some questions from the chat. So Pierre is asking, can you remind us how, uh, how fast uh, is a transaction on Lightning and how many transactions per second? Yeah, so um, of course it depends on a uh, lot of stuff. It depends on your internet connection speed, uh, but is uh, a good setup. Uh, a Lightning transaction is instant. So you hit pay and the, the merchant can receive it instantaneously. Um, especially if you have a direct channel with, with this person because the root computation will be really quick and you won't have to wait for other nodes on the route to uh, route your payment. So there are in, with the, the good setup, the perfect setup, uh, it's instant. And now with a less perfect setup, it can take a few seconds, for example. Um, for example, I, I run my uh, Lightning node behind Tor, and so it adds some delay, um, of course. And so most of my payments take maybe two, three, four seconds to 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 set up. But I think it's yeah, it's acceptable. Come so it's, it's quite a, a small delay. And how many transactions per second are possible on Lightning? So it's it's a good question as well, and it really it's quite interesting because um, we're so when we talk about transactions per second on blockchain network, uh, it's quite um, easy to to understand it because on blockchain networks there are there is uh, there are blocks that can be filled with new transactions. And once a new block is mined, these new transactions are added to the blockchain and we do it again with other transactions. <coughs> and so we have a, sorry. We have a, a global um, number of transactions per second because everyone uses the same blocks. <coughs> with Lightning, it's very dependent on um, your local neighborhood. Okay. Because you can be connected to um, a node that is very efficient and then can do 100 transactions per second, for example, or you can be connected to a node that is far less efficient and which can do only uh, 20 transactions per second, for example, and it can be linked to a lot of stuff. And can, it, can be it can be because of uh, internet speed, it can be because of uh, computing power, and, and so on. But what I can say is that today, um, so there was a benchmark that, would, that was done, and um, we seem to be uh, limited to around 100 transactions per second. But it's also important to keep in mind that most implementations today don't really try to optimize for uh, transactions per second because uh, the network is quite uh, isn't. isn't Mature, mature enough for us to optimize that just now. So I'm quite confident that we'll be able to go uh, to a bigger amount of transactions per second in the future. But it's really a, a local metric compared to blockchain networks where it is a global metric. Okay, thanks. Uh, maybe I'll continue on questions, guys, because uh, don't forget if you want to write some questions on Meetup chat. Uh, go on and I'll continue because I got many questions uh, what's your, your personal vision about the future of lightning uh, do, you, do you think maybe uh, in the future it will be easy to build on on, on top of bitcoin or, or do you think it's not made for uh, what's your opinion mm. 
I think, yeah, it's... Uh, do you mean to build protocols on top of Bitcoin? Like Lightning, for example, or, or to build applications? Because, yeah. I, I mean, um, uh, do you think uh, Lightning Network could be useful f to build dApps? Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, in the future, because um, many Bitcoiners say that Bitcoin is not made for and will never be, for example, for DeFi or etc. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, um, yeah. Yeah, m maybe not Lightning, but uh, there is uh, another protocol called RGB. Uh, so like the, the colors team, uh, red, green, blue. So in RGB, um, really the idea is to be able to create uh, tokens uh, on Bitcoin. But in the, uh, the ID behind uh, RGB are very different than the one f behind uh, the apps networks, such as uh, Ethereum, for example. It's really another mindset. So for example, in Ethereum, you have the ID that uh, every node of the network does the same computation. So when you have a smart contract that executes, it is executed by every node in the network. And um, with RGB, the, the, one of the main aspects of RGB is what we call client-side validation. And so the idea is when you have a contract, so a contract can represent, for example, a token between uh, some people, they will um, uh, share the useful data for this contract between themselves, but they won't necessarily uh, have to share it with the whole network. Right? So you, have, you just have uh, some footprints of what happens, so some hashes, for example, some uh, Merkel roots and so on, some stuff like that, that appear on the Bitcoin blockchain. But the, most of the data is kept at a local level and is validated um, by clients on their sites, which uh, allows to scale, which enables more privacy, and so on. So it's really radically different, I think, in the, the mindset behind it. But it allows to do some of the stuff that uh, uh, networks like Ethereum do today. So, for example, tokens uh, and so on. And, and yeah, it, so the development is, is uh, still in progress. Uh, it's a huge project, so it takes uh, takes some time. But I'm quite confident in the, in this uh, for the future. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And uh, do you do you think, uh, for example, for for us as a Bertie team that we're working also on, on an offline uh, part of the Bertie protocol, uh, do you imagine in the future Lightning could could be also a link to some offline protocols and useful in, in for example, in BLE uh, um, case uh, cases or sim things like that? Sorry, in, in what cases? In Bluetooth or proximity okay. drivers, case, oh, yeah, yeah, definitely, and not only Lightning but uh, Bitcoin as well. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in seeing more, uh, uh, yeah, mesh network, uh, if we can, uh, yeah, uh, call it like that, uh, for Bitcoin and Lightning because uh, I, I think that today Bitcoin relies too much on uh, the internet uh, for to work. Um, because it's easy, right? Uh, internet works uh, pretty much unless you're in the middle of a war. Um, but it's yeah, it, it's not good to be uh, so dependent on one one network, right? And so there are um, people who are aware of that and who build local mesh network that works for. So there are different ranges for for sure. So you have a radio wave, you have a LoRa network, or uh, yeah, uh, several uh, hundred of meters uh, communications. But I think that yeah, um, Bluetooth can be quite interesting. But yeah, maybe not Bluetooth, but yeah, some really uh, near field communication. And when you think about it, when you when you pay when you scan a QR code, it's already some kind of uh, uh, near field communication. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that, that's, yeah, that's about your opinion. So there is no real. Uh... Yeah, yeah, but yeah, <laughs> uh, maybe I was a bit of, off topic. I don't know, um, but yeah, I think it's quite important yeah, to be able to 
and to I, I mean it's a question of density but it would be quite uh, so I think it would be really useful to be able to uh, broadcast Bitcoin transaction in the same way that, for example, uh, Apple broadcasts, uh, you know, these things with air tags where each iPhone device, uh, so Apple device, so, sorry, um, broadcast messages uh, as uh, regarding the localization of, so the location, sorry, of, of uh, an air tag. And so it would be really interesting to have the ability to broadcast Bitcoin transactions this way instead of relying only on uh, the internet. Nice. Uh, another question about uh, Lightning, maybe, uh, I, I don't know what's the, the current state, of, for example, in El Salvador, uh, I know that the government uh, implemented the wallet, but I don't know if Lightning is uh, by default on wallets or not. Yeah, uh, it's a good question because so I think it's uh, it's quite hard to know exactly the state of, uh, of development of this wallet. What is sure that is that a few months ago it wasn't uh, really there um, because so the default seemed to be on chain Bitcoin, and I'm not even sure of that. So. So yeah, the, the behavior that was observed by some people who, some friends of mine who went there, was that um, when you were paying from this wallet, so the wallet, the government wallet uh, name is Shivo, and so when you paid from Shivo to Shivo, of course it worked very well. So it was basically a, a database, a database uh, writes, right? So, but then when you try to interact with the outside. Bitcoin or Lightning Network, this Shiva wallet, it uh, seemed like it didn't really work. So for example, there were cases where you would pay a merchant and the money would be deducted from your wallet, but never reach the merchant wallet, which can only mean one thing, which is that the Shiva uh, company in the middle had received the money, but uh, not accredited uh, the merchant. And apparently it is being fixed or some of it has already been fixed. But yeah, it's, quite, it's evolving quite rapidly. Um, so I heard like, yeah, last Sunday that they did some, I think they opened some channels for, for the Chivo to work better with uh, some, um, some widely used uh, Lightning wallets. Um, but yeah, I don't really know where it is right now. Yeah, I, I guess it's just uh, one more proof that we should never trust a government wallet. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because on the on the other side, you on the other end, you have uh, the Bitcoin Beach wallet. So Bitcoin Beach is uh, is the name of the project that started with Bitcoin in El Salvador. So in a in a, in a beach, yeah, in a, uh, a village called El Zonte. Uh, and so that, that's where it, it all started with uh, people who wanted to, to try to build uh, their own circular economy with Bitcoin. And so they developed their own wallet, which is open source, which is called uh, Bitcoin Beach Wallet. And this one works really well. So yeah, maybe it's because it's a government. It, it was quite messy as to um, um, how the decision was made to choose uh, this company. So the companies that developed Shivo. Uh, but not another company, so yeah, you know, we don't really know what happened behind the scenes. Okay, interesting. Do we have any questions from guys here? Yeah, a new one from Pierre. Um, so yeah, Zap is, uh, so was, was really cool, I think, to use when you have your own Bit, uh, Bitcoin and Lightning node. Uh, because it was fairly easy to connect from Zap to this node. Um, but I don't think that it's... So I think that support is, dis is uh, discontinued for Zap. So now I use uh, Zeus, like the, the Greek code, uh, which does quite the same thing as Zap did, and which is really great if you already have your own Lightning node. Because 
uh, it's the only way it works, right? You have to connect it to your Lightning node, and it's basically just an interface. Interface, sorry, to 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 use um, to use Lightning. Um, so if you don't already have one, um, I think that the best option is Phoenix, uh, which is built by Asin, which is a, a French company, and I like I like it because. Um, so it provides you with a non-custodial wallet, which means that you have your private key. Uh, so it's your bitcoins for real, but you don't have to open your channels by yourself by hand. It's made automatically by by uh, async. So they basically what they do is that when you have Phoenix on your phone, Phoenix acts like a lightweight uh, lightning node, and so they when you send Bitcoin for the first time, what they do is that they open a, a lightning channel between their node, so the node of async, and your node on your mobile phone, and, and they send the Bitcoin through this channel to you. So now you have a lightning channel with them, with liquidity on your side, and now you can start to use a lightning network. Um, there is Breeze with two E as well that does the same thing, it just another company another yeah but it's basically the, the main the same uh, works the same way what's your opinion about blue wallet so i like blue blue wallet is, is good but uh so when you use it for uh, bitcoin it's non-custodial which means that you have your private key but when you use it for lightning you don't have your own channels and private keys you're using the lightning infrastructure of blue wallet so what that means is that when you have money on blue wallet on lightning they say they tell you you have uh, this much uh, bitcoin on lightning but it's an iou you know you don't really have them uh cryptograph cryptographically speaking i mean um and so it's in their wallet. You don't have the private key. And so if the company decides to go away with the the, Satoshi, the, the Bitcoin from uh, the Lightning wallet part, there isn't much you can do about it. So, but yeah, Blue is great for Bitcoin on chain, but I wouldn't recommend it for uh, Bitcoin on so on Lightning. But but of course the great thing is that it's free to to use. Whereas uh, when um, uh, Phoenix, for example, opens a channel for you. Uh, so it's the non custodial wallet uh, I was speaking about in the beginning. So when it opens a channel for you, of course, there is a cost because because you have to pay a uh, Bitcoin transaction cost to open the channel. And then there is a little fee that uh, Phoenix takes uh, for the service. Okay, yeah. So we had a long question from Bertie, uh, Bertie Bassett. Uh, do you want to read it? Yeah, I think I'm reading it about uh, regarding scarcity, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So indeed, it's um, it's indeed one of the potential weakness of Bitcoin, which is that um, some someone, some government, for example, um, could indeed print an infinite amount of so lot of money, they, they love to do it, uh, as we've seen in the last years, and use it to buy Bitcoin. Mm, but, so, and to clarify, there are, there are a lot of Bitcoiners who think that some governments are doing it, just they're doing it in the shadow because they don't want to admit they're buying Bitcoin. Um, so it's possible, but in if it is done in a uh, at a large scale, it would be obvious. So it would be, I think, some kind of... Uh, they would be admitting that their system doesn't work because they are using... They are printing fiat to buy uh, Bitcoin. And second, uh, it doesn't really allow them to do anything apart from owning a lot of Bitcoin, right? It's one of the key difference, for example, between uh, Bitcoin, which is uh, based on proof of work, and other system, other cryptocurrencies that are based on proof of stake. Because in proof of stake, what matters for you to be able to validate new transactions, and therefore to be able to censor transactions if you want to, 
is uh, the amount of tokens, so of cryptocurrency that you have. Um, and, and so in proof of stake system, it's uh, doable for a government to print money in order to buy a lot of uh, cryptocurrency and then have uh, a high percentage, a high proportion of the whole uh, supply of a cryptocurrency and then be able to censor transactions of a proof of, on a proof of stake network. Whereas on a proof of work network, you have a lot of bitcoins, so that's really good for you. If you, yeah, if the price keeps on going up, you will uh, make some money, but it doesn't affect your ability to censor transactions, for example. Um, but maybe you mean, yeah, okay, shelve it like um, keep it so that it doesn't, uh, nobody is able to have it. Um, yeah. They could, but the, the interesting thing about the monetary emission is that, so as I said, you know, the, the rewards to the miners are divided by two uh, approximately every four years, which means that most of the Bitcoins in existence today were created in the beginning, because in the beginning, when a miner uh, found a new block, it was uh, rewarded with 50 Bitcoins. And today, we are we are at uh, six point uh, twenty five bitcoins per new block. So, it I think it's one of the interesting thing about this uh, emission policy is that uh, for a government to uh, be able to seize a big amount of bitcoin, it would have to have understand the potential of bitcoin really early, uh, and I don't think it's the case. So. Even if they started doing it right now, and they would be able to maybe uh, put their hands on two million bitcoins, um, something like that. So they can still buy it from the market, but um, like I said, if it's at at a large scale, people will notice and won't uh, won't sell their bitcoins to to the government. I think. Another question from Pierre. Uh, is Lightning Network a good solution for online shops? Uh, or does it doesn't make any sense to have a quick transaction there? Yeah, so indeed, uh, the quick transaction aspect is really crucial when you're talking about uh, mid-space, yeah, so in the real world, but maybe less so in uh, for an online shop. But another, so because for example, when the network, when there isn't a lot of load on the network, like today, for example, uh, a Bitcoin transaction on chain will uh, settle in a matter of minutes, maybe hours. It depends on the fees uh, that uh, the user agreed to pay. Um, and so I think it's, yeah. It works for an online shop to have to wait uh, a few hours uh, between the moment the user pay and the moment that you start to process the order because you've received the payment. Um, but another aspect of Lightning is that it allows to do transactions with very, very small amounts. For example, there is a thing on Bitcoin called the dust limit, which is uh, an anti uh, DOS anti-spam uh, measure, so you can't spend on chain uh, less than uh, I think it's 540 uh, satoshis. Uh, a satoshi being the, the base unit of Bitcoin, so it's uh, one millionth, uh, 100 millionth of a Bitcoin. So it's quite a small amount, but you can't spend uh, on chain less than 500 satoshis. As on Lightning, you can spend from one satoshi to um, whatever amount you want. And so it enables micropayments, for example. So you, you could pay with Lightning, uh, you could buy uh, press articles uh, one by one if you want. So you know you don't want to subscribe uh, for uh, 10 bucks a month to uh, a newspaper, but you really want to read this article, you can pay uh, five cents to unlock this specific article that you want to read, for example and so on. It enables tips. You can tip uh, people uh, so with small amounts if you want. Um, there is 
something I, I quite like, which is called Podcasting 2.0, which is uh, so it's uh, um, a rework of the way podcasts work to enable um, people to stream Bitcoin at the same time that they stream content. So you can pay by the minute. You can say, I want to pay this podcaster uh, 10 satoshis per minute. And so while you're listening to your podcast, you automatically transfer funds. So you automatically tip your uh, your favorite podcaster, which I think is quite interesting. So there are lots of stuff. Maybe for an online shop, it isn't absolutely necessary. So I think it's a nice touch to have. Um, especially if you believe that Bitcoin will be widely adopted in the future. So we won't have cheap fees on the Bitcoin main layer forever. And sometimes in the future, in the future you, you will need to have uh, lightning uh, to be able to do transactions in a timely manner. But right now, yeah, it's not, it's not uh, necessary. And as I said, there are lots of um, it can be a burden, you know, to have to manage your liquidity because, as I said, when you are an online shop, you mostly receive, and so you have to deal with this liquidity that you uh, on one side of your channels only. Okay, thanks. Uh, maybe an, another question about uh, maybe my last question, I promise. Uh, <laughs> About uh, privacy on, on Lightning Network, what's your, mm. your what's your opinion or challenges uh, we're facing? It's a really good question because there are lots of misconceptions. Uh, so, for instance, Lightning is often sold as um, having strong privacy features, or even people who present Lightning as some kind of privacy layer for Bitcoin. And why do they do that? Is because so. Um, yeah, when, when I mentioned that the fact that you can root your transaction, so you you, have, you want to pay someone, but you're not directly connected with this person. So you you can root your payments through other channels on the network. And this routing is done via something called onion routing. And so it's quite similar to the way uh, the Tor and the Tor browser work. Um, so basically, uh, intermediary on the payment path don't know um, where the payment comes from originally, nor do they know where it is uh, uh, addressed in the end, right? They don't know who is the sender and who is the recipient. Um, so that's one thing. Um, another thing that uh, makes people think that Lightning is great for privacy is the fact that, you know, um, as I said, uh, only the two nodes of a channel know uh, where are the funds at a given time inside the channel. So the rest of the world only sees what we call the channel capacity, which is the total amount of Bitcoins that are on this channel. But how they are, so on which side they are, so how many Bitcoins there are on each side of the channel, only the two nodes of the channel know it. Um, but it is actually possible to um, try to um, to guess in a certain sense where the liquidity is inside the channel using some techniques called probing and so probing uh, basically what you do is that you send fake payments and you see when they fail so when the payment fails uh, you get an error message in return and when the error message says that the payment failed because there wasn't enough liquidity on this side of the channel, you have an information about, about where the liquidity is on the channel. And you can, so you can use it to know uh, how the liquidity is, uh, to where the liquidity is inside the channel. But you can actually use it to try to track payments by tracking the way liquidity moves inside channels. So I would say that um, tracking privacy is okay. But um, it isn't just the yeah, it isn't the end game of privacy at all. Um, but yeah, it's it's still I think it's still a bit better than Bitcoin on chain, for example, because Bitcoin on chain you you know you record everything uh, on the blockchain, which can be 
than seen by anyone for the decades and centuries to come. Whereas on Lightning, it's a bit more private. You do uh, Lightning transactions, but in the end, it's always uh, you still have you know a, a Bitcoin transaction to open a channel. You still have a Bitcoin transaction to close a channel. So there are still things that can be seen. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. And do I think the big banks are already using Bitcoin for the transaction due to speed and cost? Um, I don't know, actually. Maybe, I think there were some cases, but uh, mainly for uh, countries that were trying to, for example, evade US sanctions. Uh, and because right now, um, when you, so, when you're two banks and you're trying to do trade, so in the same country, I think it's quite quick. When you're trying to do it uh, internationally, that's when things be start to become a bit uh, slower. But I think most of the world uses dollars, uh, except countries that aren't allowed uh, to use dollar because they are uh, under US sanctions. And for these countries, Bitcoin makes a lot of sense. And so I think there were cases where, for example, the uh, Iranian bank used Bitcoin to pay for, I don't know, I don't know which country. There were cases in uh, Latin America too, between, uh, so, um, between two countries, I don't remember which. Um, but yeah, I don't think they're using it at scale because we would see it if they were really doing a lot of Bitcoin transactions between them. And I think that, yeah, they're still busy trying to build their own uh, uh, blockchain solutions, which has, which are always centralized. They don't, they don't like Bitcoin because they aren't really in control. Um, but, uh, I agree with you that it will save them right now a lot of money and do a lot of stuff happen more quickly, but you still have the problem to of uh, currency conversion in the end. And I don't think banks are ready to hold Bitcoin on their balance sheet, for example. Not yet. Yeah, not yet. But maybe they do, maybe some of them. Yeah, it's, uh, Pierre, it's totally possible to extend messages using uh, the Lightning Network. Actually, it's already being done. Uh, there is, because when you, so there are, yeah, there are several ways to do it. But um, one way, for example, is the fact that uh, when you send a, a Lightning transaction, you can attach uh, arbitrary data to this transaction. And I don't think you have any size limit for this data. Yeah, so you can send anything you want. And so there are protocols such as Sphinx, so Sphinx chat, maybe they are already there, which use just this. To, so you can chat with other people with lightning transactions. So it's, yeah, it's a, it costs you a few satoshis um, because you have to actually do lightning transactions and pay any intermediary that is uh, involved in writing your transactions but this way you can do you you can yeah do chat on lightning and you can do a private chat because as i mentioned uh, lightning uses onion routing and so your message is encrypted in a way that only your final recipient can read the message um, so yeah it's uh, yeah private messaging on lightning is totally doable and is, is actually done yeah. Uh, I got a question about uh, Samurai Wallet. Do you, what's your opinion about it? Back it a lot. Uh, so yeah, there was some kind of uh, of drama recently between uh, Samurai yeah. Wallet and, uh, and Wasabi Wallet. So uh, yeah, I, I use I really love the Samurai Wallet product. So basically, what it does for for because I'm, I'm not I, I don't think everyone knows Samurai, but it's a tool to use Bitcoin more privately. So with stuff like coin joins, which are transactions where you, um, you do a transaction with a lot of other people, in a way that uh, there are a lot of inputs to this transaction that look the same and a lot of outputs from this transaction that look the same. And so it's impossible 
uh, for anyone who looks at the transaction to know where a given input uh, went in the end. Um, and there are other privacy tools in some way wallet. And uh, I, yeah, I really like them. I was, uh, I never really, I, I was never really confident into Wasabi Wallet. There were a lot of uh, flaws that were pointed out actually by the Samurai team, um, which were some of them patched in the new version, but they've uh, decided now to begin to censor some uh, some some bitcoins you know the, the wasabi team which is i think uh, antithetical to what they are trying to they were trying to achieve in the first place so yeah i really like samurai and i would advise to use it instead of wasabi <laughs> but uh yeah the, the thing is the samurai team is, isn't uh, maybe the, the best one for the marketing aspect because they are they are quite uh, rough on, on twitter but uh yeah, they deliver, I think, great solutions and great software. Yeah, totally agree. <laughs> okay, uh, so maybe if you want to ask a last question, uh, during this time I can say uh, a huge thanks uh, for all this uh, documentation and for, for your opinion also. Uh, really nice to, to ask yeah. you. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. It was a pleasure. I hope my uh, sorry, yeah, my my English is a bit rusty. Um, I don't speak English very often, so I hope it was uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I was really happy to to be here. Don't worry for English. Uh, we are a lot of <laughs> uh, French that are bad in English too, so yeah. no worry. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Great. Thank you, uh, Bertie. <laughs> and yeah, thank you, all people you. joining. And thank you. Yeah, do not hesitate to to join us or may, even to ask uh, all the questions when you need on this chat. We'll try to find the answers when we when we can. And um, yeah, so see you next time, maybe next month, I think. Yeah, on six April. So yeah, thanks again, uh, Fanil, and maybe see you next time at Paris Peer to Peer Festival or somewhere in the internet. Sure. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you so much.